All right, thank you for that reading, brother. I was just thinking about what to preach this morning. I wasn't. I, I am going to this afternoon. I'll be preaching through the Psalms. You know, we're going through the Psalms. Uh, but this morning, I wanted to just preach on a topical sermon. I was thinking, you know, what kind of sermon does the church need? You know, often when I, as a pastor, I'm thinking of something topical. What is it that the church needs? But this time, I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to flip the tables a little bit. What does the pastor need? <laughs> okay, <laughs> what does the pastor need? And so, um, it's for, of course, it's for the church, but. Um, Basically, I decided to call this sermon this morning, Support Your Pastor. Support Your Pastor, okay? And I don't often preach these kind of sermons, and, you know, it sounds a bit weird to preach it. But listen, it's coming from God's Word. We'll, we'll see a, a few things, a few parallels with my life, with my ministry, with the ministry of New Life Baptist Church, and Blessed Up Baptist Church down in Sydney. And, uh, you know, I, I realized, you know, going, becoming a pastor is something that um, I never kind of envisioned like, as a child, my parents thought I'd become a pastor because I had a love for God, I had a love for the Bible, maybe more so than the average person. And they just thought, if, if someone's going to be a pastor in the family, it's probably going to be Kevin. And I remember as a child, that just frustrated me. You know, it's not like, you know, you don't want to have like your life, life planned out. Like, you know, it's my decision to decide what I'm going to do with my life. But I don't know, I guess my parents got their way somehow. But, um, and, and then, you know, I, I look at the pastors preach, I look at churches and I think, oh, I'll never be able to do that. You know, I, I love the Lord and I, I can't really do that. And, uh, you know, you don't really know. Like, obviously, you, you can read your Bible, you can kind of uh, uh, observe and, and see how other pastors are, and maybe you're, you're, you, know, you, you get a bit of the behind-scenes look if you get into ministry. You don't really know until you actually do the job. It's, it's like any other job. Like, you, you know the, what, what the job is, you know the company maybe, but you don't really know until you start doing the job. You know, and you start learning a lot about what it is like to be a pastor. And there's something here in 1 Samuel chapter 7 that I want us to look at, verse number 15. Verse number 15, and I know Samuel wasn't a pastor necessarily, okay, but we, we, he was definitely a man of God, a man of God that he was using to, to preach to Israel. And not only was Samuel a prophet, we often know him as a prophet, but Samuel was also a judge, okay, he had authority. You know, he was like part of the government, as it were, right? the government of Israel. And so when disputes would arise, when issues would arise, you know, Samuel would not only be preaching, the, teaching the Bible, but he would be going there sorting out issues uh, amongst the nation. And so we look at verse number 15 here, 1 Samuel 7, 15, it says, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Let me just stop there for a moment. And you know, when I decided to become a pastor, I, I did not envision, I thought, and saying, well, you know, I'll do it for five years and let's see how it goes. You know, I'll, I'll, let's do it for 20 years and see how it goes. You know, when I decided to become a pastor, I set aside my career. You know, I, I set aside my career growth and all that kind of stuff. I know that if I serve as a pastor for 20 years, let's say, and then I can't be a pastor and I have to step down, that it's going to be hard to get back into the workforce. Because now I've got 20 years where I've not been doing, you know, secular kind of work. So, you know, when you decide to become a pastor, you have to realize this is for the long haul. Just like Samuel, he judged Israel all the days of his life. That's what it's like, you know. When you decide to become a pastor, it's not like, well, I can just quit my job and find another job, ten, you know, if it doesn't work out. No, you know, your, your heart, your mind ought to be, I'm going to be a pastor all the days of my life. Verse number 16, it says, And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel, to Gilgal, to Mizpeh, and judged Israel in all those places. Now, this is what I liked about this, because that's what I think about myself right now. Again, it wasn't my goal to have a circuit. Okay, It wasn't my goal, you know, when I started a church and became a pastor, to go, well, you know, once a week I'm going to have to travel down to Sydney and bless it up Baptist Church, and three years in, I'm going to have to find myself located down there, and I'm going to have to travel back up. But, you know, this is something that we see in the Bible, uh, that there are few men, okay, where, where you would need to basically take one of these men, someone like a Samuel, and he's going to develop a circuit going from town to town, from city to city, to be a judge, to be a preacher, to serve God. And this is the reality, I suppose. It was, again, not my desire. It wasn't my goal when I became a pastor. But we find ourselves in this situation. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm traveling back and forth between Sydney and Sunshine Coast, it wears you out a little bit, you know, every week it's, you know, that constant travel, it doesn't seem like much, but it is, it is service, you know, I know when I get to heaven, God's going to reward me a little bit just to sit on a plane for how many hours, you know, every single week, right, there's going to be something there for that, right, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it might sound great, oh man, so it must be so good traveling, you know, uh, after a while it gets old, I'm telling you, <laughs> you know, it's, it, yeah, it was great the first week, it was great the first month maybe, the only thing that keeps me going is just the, the, the blessings of being in, in fellowship with other brethren, to, to be able to serve the Lord and to love the brethren. That's what keeps you going, right? To, to just know that there are very few men that are there. And, you know, like Samuel, you, you know, in my situation, I've had to develop a circuit from the Sydney to the Sunshine Coast. But notice verse number 17. 
And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house. And there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. So you notice that Samuel, even though he was traveling from city to city, town to town, you know, being a judge, he did have one central location. You know, Ramah, where uh, there was his house. And let me just reinforce once again that, you know, the Sunshine Coast, this is my home. Okay, I moved here and said, this is where my house is going to be. This is where my home is going to be. You know, you guys now know that I was trying to search for a house, trying to find a place, because this is where I need to be stationed. This is where God has sent me. This is where my heart is. This is my priority. Okay, you need to understand that, you know, even though uh, Samuel had all these circuits and all these places he had to travel, there was one place that he was really established, one place where his family was, where his home was. And you know what? That's our goal in four months to get back up here. And I want you to know that, you know, I I don't have any desire to stay in Sydney. Uh, You know, I mean, if it's God's will, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's God's will. But, you know, it's not my desire. My desire is to get back up here, you know, finish the work that God has uh, called me to do. And just for the time being, I'm just going to have to continue that circuit. Okay, maybe one day God's going to open up another place, right? A Melbourne, a Brisbane, who knows? And then I'm going to have to add to the circuit there, okay? Anyway, this is the situation. And and as you guys know, not every pastor has this situation. You know, it's happened. There was a necessity. I I felt that I could achieve that need. I could fulfill that need. And this is where we find ourselves. Now, I'm not preaching this so you can like feel sorry for me. Oh, what a great pastor we have. I'm just a man. I, I have my faults. I look at some of you guys, and I think you guys are better than me anyway. <laughs> like, so, so many times, I, that's just my mindset. I just look at some of you guys, and I'm like, man, I don't know why you made me a pastor, Lord, but you know, there, are, there are other great men here that could probably serve you in a better capacity. I don't know. But you know, it's, it's in the Lord's hands. But I'm not preaching this so you guys can like, you know, think highly of me or anything like this. But I, I just want you to understand, there are, there are stresses. There, there, are three, there, are, there are things that you don't necessarily know about. And I, and I don't need to even share those necessary, necessarily, okay? But, you know, you ought to be praying for your pastor. You ought to understand that it actually takes a toll, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually. And I need your support. You know, I need your... And you have been supporting. I'm not not preaching this because you haven't been supporting me. I just hope that, you know, by preaching this, if there ever comes a time where you're like, ah, that Pastor Kevin, he's letting us down, that you just remember this this sermon, right? And you get back on, on, on the support for your pastor. Especially, you know, if you know that my heart is to serve the Lord, to serve the brethren. I'm not in some, you know, major sin or something like that. Obviously, that's a different thing. But, you know, I, I do need your support. I, I need to hear it from time to time, you know, just honestly, just as a man, that you guys are behind me, that you guys are praying for me. Uh, those kinds of things just, just encourages me uh, because I am made of the same flesh and blood. You know, I do go through the same kind of doubts and worries and stresses that anyone else does, you know. But notice the next chapter, Second, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 1. I want you to see the kind of toll it took on Samuel because we know Samuel was a godly man. We know God used Samuel in a mighty way, a mighty, mighty way, okay, but as he's trying to serve the Lord with all his heart, you notice that he took a significant risk in taking on this ministry. Because in verse number one, it says, And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. And then it says in verse number two, Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abiah. Look at this. And they were judges in Beersheba. Okay? So Samuel takes his sons, puts them as judges. Hey, you can work for the Lord, you can work for this nation uh, that God has established. He sets them as judges in Beersheba. I like that because over here we have like Biwa and like Bibaram. Well, they had Beersheba. <laughs> so I don't know. It must have been the Sunshine Coast or something, right? <laughs> so think about my sons growing up in this area. Maybe we need churches in these other B places. Uh, I never wanted to live in those suburbs, by the way, because I just think, man, B, you know, like I don't want to be associated with that. But anyway, it's in the Bible, okay? Maybe they're following biblical names here, okay? But look at, look, what, look at the sense about the sons in verse number three. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after Luca and took Luca's, his money and took bribes and perverted judgment. That's amazing. It's so sad to, for me to read that, right? And, and, uh, and, and, you know, it's not just Bible. I've seen this. I've seen godly men. You know, men that you know just trying to serve the Lord, love the Lord, you know, and, and sometimes... The family gets sacrificed. You know, sometimes you see that there's cracks developing in the family. I'm not just talking about any family. Like every family, there's some drama, right? I mean, you guys know. You guys are all part of a family, right? Every family, there's going to be some contention, some arguments, and that's just, that's part of life, okay? But it makes me really sad when I see this take place, where Samuel's just faithfully serving the Lord. And I, I, we, we don't know much about Samuel. You know, you could kind of say, well, maybe he failed as a father to some extent here, uh, definitely. Uh, but 
he didn't fail as a father because he was like a drunkard. He didn't fail as a father because he was some, you know, uh, wicked man and, you know, living after money and chasing wealth. He, he didn't fail as a father because of that. He failed as a father because his attention was on the church. His attention was on the people. His attention was on all these towns and places that he would travel and visit. And, you know, this is in the Bible, so we can look at this, we can, we can uh, understand that ministry takes a toll on the pastor's family, okay? And, you know, there are increased risks to being a circuit preacher or a circuit pastor. There are, there are increased risks, okay? Because, as you guys know, if I'm going there every week, I'm, I'm not seeing my family seven days a week. I'm seeing them six days a week, you know, and if there's some type of delay, some type of cancellation, it might be that week, five times a week that I see my family. And so the less you see, you know, your wife and your children, the less influential you can be, right? Or you, you, your mind might be busy on other matters, other issues, and you may not necessarily see the kind of cracks that are developing in your family. Now, again, I'm not preaching this because I'm seeing cracks develop in my family, okay? I'm preaching this because I don't want it to become that. <laughs> Do you understand that? You know, and, and we need to look at the Bible and just understand this is a reality of the kind of position that I have and the travel that I do, which is why I need your support. You know, I, I need your support. And you need to understand that, you know, yes, I'm, I'm the pastor, but I'm also a family man. You know, I'm, I'm a pastor, but I'm also a, a husband. I'm a pastor, but I'm also a, a father, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and I've got parents and I've got, ex, you know, family and I've got other people that I think about and, and love and I'm concerned about beyond just the two churches, New, New Life Baptist Church and Blessed Hope Baptist Church. Now, I want you to notice what happens. So, and, but actually, before we, we keep going, I want you to notice about the sons. So it says his sons not, not, uh, walked not in his ways, but turned... So what they're doing is not the ways of Samuel, okay? The sons, yeah, they turned aside after Luca and took bribes, okay, perverted judgment. So what, what, what were they interested in becoming a, a, a judge? They were interested in the money. They were interested in how much are we going to make. And it's not going to be enough. We, let's take some bribes and let's pervert judgment so we can get uh, rich basically being these judges and people in authority you know and this is again a reality in in part there are pastors i'm telling you there are you, you guys know i mean there are pastors that are just filthy rich with their own private jets you know why do you think they became a pastor <laughs> do you think there are samuel or one of samuel's kids behaving that way now look I, I don't know i don't know if samuel's children were you know reprobate you know just, or just just wicked christians i mean you know christians can be wicked <laughs> they can be saved, but, you know, if they don't grow, they just live in the flesh, they can just, the same, they can be affected by the same temptations that anyone that is unsaved can, can have, can face, which is why it's so important that, you know, when we choose a pastor, when we look at a pastor, we need to understand this man's not doing it for the money. You know, it, it's got to be so clear that he's not doing it for the money, right? And again, that's one of the things that, you know, probably one of the things that frustrates me the most, being a pastor, is like, oh, you know, how much he's making, you know? Uh, you know, I bet you, you know, you know, he's, he, you know, it's like, why doesn't he get a job or something like that? Like, you know, what, what? it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you, are you like honestly kidding me? Like, if you want to have an independent fundamental Baptist church and, and preach the doctrines that we preach, you're not, you, you, look, I'm telling you now, you're not doing it for the money. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you're, you're just better off just working any, for any hospitality, like you'd make money anywhere else. I, I'm telling you, I'm like, you know, I, what I'm saying to you, brethren, I've, I've never done this for the money, you know, and what frustrates me is when people start, you know, using money as some type of like, oh, you said this or you said that, man, you know, I don't know, I don't know what the future holds, right? When we started this church, I had no idea whether I'd even, I'd even be able to get some type of paycheck here. I didn't, I didn't start the church for that, okay? But the reality is, just like any job, like if you go, like imagine you going to work and someone saying to you, I know why you come to work, you come to get paid, don't you? It's like, well, obviously. <laughs> but you know what? To a pastor, it's like, that's like a bad thing almost. It's like, well, don't you know I've got to provide? I've got to pay rent or pay a mortgage or provide for my family? Of course I've got to do it for the money to some extent, okay? But that's not what's, you know, it, but really, if, that, if that's all I was chasing, I, the last thing I would do is be a pastor. It's the poorest job I've ever had. I've earned more job as a teenager in my early 20s than I ever have as a pastor. You know, if you, you know, can calculate inflation and stuff like that. You know, this is, this is a low-paying job, brethren. But I'm not complaining. I, I love it. I, lo I love this job. I love this job, right? Um, it's, it's helped me to walk in faith, you know, more than I ever have. So I, I, hate, I hate that kind of talk, like, oh, there's ulterior motives for being a pastor. 
you know what, then you become the pastor. <laughs> you know what, if that's really what you think, like, you know, honestly, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating. But anyway, let's keep going, verse number four. Second Samuel chapter eight, verse number four. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. I want you to notice that. Everyone sees um, the, the children of, um, of Samuel, okay? And yeah, they're wicked, right? They're, they're, they're not doing right. And they're saying, well, because of your kids, Samuel, and you're getting old as well, you know what? This, this system of judges that God has instituted, we don't want that anymore. We want to be like the other nations. We want to be like, uh, we want to have a king. But notice why they're blaming Like, what's their reason for it? They're blaming Samuel. They're blaming Samuel's kids. You're too old, your kids are wicked. So we want a king. Okay, now I want you to notice that. Because, you know, quite often when you read this quickly, that's 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 the reason you think that they want a king. Because they realize Samuel has failed. And and to some extent, Samuel has failed. And again, this is a reality of a pastor, that people are watching your family, they're watching your kids, they're watching your life, and people are just itching to find something to blame you for. That just, just something, you know, that, that the pastor has done something wrong. Or his, did you hear what his child said? Right? And it's like, well, you know, this, this is not working anymore. We, we, need, we need another system. We need another king. We need someone else. You know, we need something else. Or they're out of church. Why did you leave church? Oh, it's pastors, you know. Pastor's wife. Pastor's kids. I'm way out of church. It, it, you know, there's always a reason, right? And they, they're finding the reason. That's what they're saying. They're saying, Samuel, it's your fault. You and your kids... You messed it up. We want a king. Okay? But I want you to notice what God says. Okay? It says in verse number 6, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. Look at this. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You see, it wasn't about Samuel and his kids, really, at the end of the day. The, pe- the people in this nation, the Israelites, had rejected God. Okay? And now they're trying to find a reason. Instead of saying, hey, I reject God, they're going, well, let's wait for Samuel to mess up. Let's, make, let's wait for him to stuff up. Now he's stuffed up. Yes! Samuel, now we can say, now we can get out of church. Now we can get out of, out of the ministry. Now we can get outside of God's will. And we can just blame Samuel and his kids. Okay? But God says, no, it's not that. That's not right. the reason, Samuel. Relax. They rejected me, okay? It's, it's not you, Samuel. And, you know, this is the, you know, the, again, this is part of being a pastor. If someone wants to be a pastor one day, you have to understand people are going to look to you to, like, to blame you and to blame your family, you know? Not because, really, they have anything against you. It's like they're not right with God. That's the reason why. That's ultimately the reason why. You know, again, it's, I'm not talking about major sins of a pastor. There's, a, there's, you know, proper process for all of that. I'm just talking about, you know, th- this is what happens, you know. Churches, I, I once heard the saying, you know, from somebody, I can't remember who, and they would often say, you know, people come and people go. And I just thought, man, I don't want to think like that as a church. People come and people go. It just seems so, you know, I don't know. It just seems so insensitive or uncaring, unloving. But then I realized that's just, that's what happens. People come and people go. And they'll find, and, and look, when people want to go, they want to go and they'll just find something to, they'll find some reason. Okay, but really the reason is I'm not right with God and I need to go. Okay, but they won't say that. They won't say that. They'll, they'll find a reason, somebody, some issue to, to blame. And uh, look at verse number eight. It says, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up, uh, up out of Egypt, even unto this day, where if they have forsaken me and served other gods, so, they also, so do they also unto thee. Okay, so God's saying, look, don't worry. He's giving Samuel some comfort. You didn't mess up that bad, Samuel. Okay, you messed up a little bit as a parent, but that's, the, you, know, you, you know, I guess Samuel was very burdened. He thought the reason they're walking away from the Lord is because he stuffed up. The Lord's saying, no, they've done it from the very beginning. Since the time they left Egypt <laughs> till this time, they've been rejecting me. Okay? So as I was saying, brethren, you know, being a pastor, there are sort of um, stresses and worries that probably you don't really expect or think about until you do the job. And that's okay. That's part of the job, right? I remember when I was working in a, in a business and one of my, he wasn't my manager, but he was a manager that I got along with really well. And he had all these problems, all these issues. And um, I said to him once, man, how do you handle all this stuff? Like, I, I feel sorry for you. He goes, don't feel sorry for me. That's why I, I earned the big bucks. All right. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. You earn the big bucks and you get all the stress. Makes sense. 
But here's the thing about being, you're not going to earn big bucks here on the earth, right? So I'm, I'm hoping God's just earning me the big bucks in heaven. Right? Hopefully that's where I'm going to get the big bucks, right? It's all being saved up there in heaven. But so, you know, I'm not downcast. I'm not preaching this because I'm downcast or anything like that. But again, I need your support because I know that, you know, I have the man, the, the old man. I have the new man. And you know, quite often I'm in the new man right now. I feel like I'm in the new man. I'm happy. But there can be times when I'm in the old man and be, you know, downcast and frustrated and worried about different things where really the Lord's just earning me the big bucks in heaven. I need to remind myself about that, okay? But in saying this, you need to understand that, um, you know, I have priorities. And, and one thing you guys know, as I said, you know, New Life Baptist Church as a church is my priority. You know, Blessed Hope Baptist Church is a priority as well. But if I, you know, at the end of the day, you know, this is where the Lord has called me to come. This church is, is my priority. But I have a greater priority than New Life Baptist Church. And that's my family. Okay, and, and I don't know if that sounds unusual. I've never really heard any other pastor say this. I'm just being honest with you. My, my family is my priority. They were my ministry before New Life Baptist Church. And if I didn't have them, I would not be a pastor. I w- I w- we would not have New Life Baptist Church. Okay, and I say this because I, I want you to understand, I'm not like this pastor. I'm not like this guy that's just hell-bent on being a pastor no matter what. You know what? If, if I find that I can't, like I'm having cracks and problems in my marriage or with my children, major issues, then I'm probably just say to you, just honestly, Reverend, thanks for having me as a pastor, you know, but I'm going to have to step down. You know, I've got a greater ministry to take care of. Or maybe even a temporary period. Guys, give me three months. I'll step down just for three months for now. Let me sort out some of these things. If we get that working, I'll get back on, you know, on the program. Something like that. Who knows, right? But I, I want you to understand, my family is my priority. Okay? And really, at the end of the day, each one of us with our families, that ought to be your priority. You know, that, that's how it ought to be. Okay, uh, I've always said a strong church requires strong families. Okay, and so the stronger your family, the stronger this church uh, will be. I, I, I recall back in again in the workplace, and I was getting uh, different promotions, and you know I was doing well. I was my career, I was growing in my career, and I, there was a, there was a meeting, and they you know I, I heard about it because they were talking about me. In, I wasn't in that meeting. They were talking about me, and basically the assessment that people left of me was basically. If Kevin had to choose between his career and his family, he'd choose his family. And, and I heard that feedback from somebody there, okay? And I don't know if they kind of like maybe mocking me or not. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know why, why, they, why, why that was an issue. But I'm like, absolutely, 100%. Praise God, they understand that about me, right? That I, I'm not chasing uh, filthy lucre. Look, if, if money comes, then uh, great, money goes as well, right? But at the end of the day, if I had to choose between these two things, it's definitely going to be my family. It's always been that way. I'm, I'm a family man. Okay, I love my family. And um, yeah, as I said, you know, outside of normal family issues, you know, if, if, if my family was breaking down, you know, for me, I, I, would, I would step down as a pastor. Okay, so I'm, I'm saying this because I don't want that to happen. And, and, and it may never happen, I don't know, but, I, but then I look at pastors and it happens. I look at pastors in Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, then it happens. I see children of independent fundamental Baptist pastors and they're in the world and they don't care about God and they don't care about church. It happens. So, I, you know, even though I, I don't think it will happen, I don't want it to happen, it could happen. It happens to Samuel. So, I, I need your support, you know. I need your support. You know, I became a pastor out of necessity, honestly. I just thought, man, where are these churches? Amen. Soul winning, you know, preaching without... You know, compromise, without fear. Where are these churches? Great, I can see some in America, but where are they in Australia? I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm not saying, I'm sure people are doing the, the best they can, but where's that zeal? Where's that passion? Where's that love for the lost? You know, and I, I looked, there's a need. And I was like, well, no one's doing it. Okay. And yes, I had a desire to become a pastor. Of course I had a desire, but really more than the desire was the need. Why did we start Blessed Hope Baptist Church? A need developed. I, look, I wasn't excited to get on a plane every week and travel and, and add more preaching and more stress and worries and more families to you know, think about and pray about. I, didn't, I wasn't looking for that. I saw a need. A need. Well, who's going to do it? Ah, I guess it's me. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's what happens, right? Now, in Isaiah 6, uh, 6, 8, I'll just read it to you. Isaiah 6, 8. It, uh, Isaiah says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. <laughs> okay? Here am I, send me. That's ultimately what it is, right? You see a need. God says there's a need. Who am I going to send? Okay. <laughs> I'll be the guy, God, if you want me to be the guy. That's basically why I became a pastor. 
Again, I wasn't hell bent. I would have loved someone, you know, others to be the ones that get up and, and say, well, there's some brethren on the Sunshine Coast and I'm going to go and start that church. Praise God. I'll support you. I'll pray for you. I'll encourage you. Praise God. I wish it was someone else, you know. But praise God, it's me, you know. Praise God. You know, Sydney, praise God. Yeah, send me, Lord, if that's where you need me to go. Send me. Say, what, what about the calling? You know, did you get called by God? Well, I mean, isn't the necessity the calling? There's a need. There, there it is. There's the calling. All right, God, I'll go then. <laughs> I mean, I don't have to see dreams and visions and, you know, it's, I mean, there's a need, there's a need. And if I meet the qualifications and it can happen, then let's do it, you know. Again, I, I'm not preaching this complaining or whining or anything. I, I, I'm happy. I, I love my job. It's the best job I've ever had. Okay, except in my bank account, but it's the best job I've ever had. Okay. <laughs> now, can you please turn to Psalm 12 for me? Psalm 12 in verse number 1. Psalm 12 in verse number 1. Again, I'm not preaching this to puff myself up. I, I'm not. I'm not, you know. I just realize there aren't many pastors these days, like faithful pastors that love the Lord and love the lost. It's, it's rare, and I, I don't know why it's rare. Maybe I do know why it's rare, but anyway, it's rare, okay? And this is one main reason why you should support your pastor, okay? And, and look, one day you might be in another church and have another pastor. I'm not saying this is the reason why you should support me necessarily, but any, pa- any pastors that are faithfully serving the Lord, why you should support them. Amen. Hey, you know what? Pastor Stevenson comes to, here to preach. I love Pastor Stevenson. He's got some different ideas, has some fu- funny jokes, makes me cringe sometimes. I love him, but he's a pastor. He's trying to serve the Lord. He's trying to love the brethren. He loves New Life Baptist Church. I know he prays for us and he prays for me. I'm going to support him. You know what? I'm going to support him. Because look at Psalm 12 in verse number 1. Psalm 12 in verse number 1. The psalmist says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. The, the psalm is saying there is very few godly men. It's sea sin. Where are they, Lord? This is why I'm just going to support a pastor. Like, I, you know what? You're, you're doing the best you can. You might be a little bit different to me in this area, that area. Hey, but if you're saved, you love the Lord, you love the brethren, you know, you're my brother in Christ, and, and you're just doing the best you can with what you have, your experiences, you know, and, and how you are trained, and you, okay, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to support you. You know, and because uh, there's so few. The faithful fail from among the children of men. There are so few faithful men. Verse number two, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. And this is what you've got to be careful of as a pastor. With flattering lips and with a double heart. Do so they speak? The double heart is like the backstabber, right? They, they speak to you nicely on one side and then behind your back they're stabbing you. But all well, the time they're flattering you with their lips. This is something hard to manage as a pastor. Because people say, yeah, that was a good sermon. Thank you for being a pastor. Thank you for that. That's great. I, I, again, support your pastor. That's a great way to support your pastor, isn't it? Give good feedback if you've learned something from God's word. But then there are some that are just overboard. And, you, you know, you, you don't want to, you don't, you, don't wanna, you know, necessarily, you know, think wrongly of someone that might be a little bit over because they just might be a little bit overboard. They might be just truly excited and, and truly. But then there are those with ulterior motives and harmful purposes that will flatter you as well. And it can be hard sometimes to work out who they are, you know? Verse number three. I love verse number three because sometimes I don't have to worry about it. It says, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speak of proud things. So, you know what? I might not be the best judge of character. I don't know. I might not always see the red flags that everyone else sees, but the Lord's going to take care of it. (laughs) Okay? That's awesome. Okay? Now, can you turn to Philippians chapter 2? Philippians chapter 2. The reason we looked at Psalm just then, I just wanted to show you this is a good reason to support your pastor. The godly man ceaseth, right? The faithful fail from among the children of men. There's very few that want the job and, and will be faithful toward the job is what I'm trying to say. You know, very few that will be faithful toward the job and, and do things the way the Lord wants it to be done. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 19. Again, I'm not reading this to puff myself up, Reverend, because I know my weaknesses. I know I'm just a man. I, I, I know my sins. Okay? I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm not that great. Honestly. Okay? But Philippians chapter 2, verse number 19. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 19. It says, 
But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. And I, I've read this before when I, before I left, I read this passage to you, but it says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. This boggles my mind, this passage. What? You know, when I read the Bible, the New Testament, I read all these names. I see Paul and his Timotheus and Silas and these men on these journeys, starting churches, being sent by the Antioch church, right? There are apostles and they're doing miracles. And, it, you know, it, it just seems like, man, what a, what, a, what a great place to be. The beginning of, of the New Testament churches. And I'm sure it was a great time to be, to live. But then we get to this point in Philippians. And Paul says, look, I've only got Timotheus to send to you. You know, and, and you know, if you ever have, you know, one man, why, why did Kevin have to go to Sydney? You know, or maybe the people in Sydney are thinking, I hope he stays. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to stay. I'm coming up here. But, you know, if there's any kind of thoughts, it's, it's, you know, I'm not trying to stop people from progressing. I'm not trying to stop people from maybe becoming a pastor or, or a servant. It's just that there's very few that will naturally care for your state. There's, there's actually few people like that. Paul only had Timotheus. He goes, everyone else, you know what? Everyone else. And he's talking about people that he's with in his churches. And I'm not saying this is about you guys. I'm just saying, like, this is just the reality of the, of the Bible. He goes, everyone else, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. It's a sad, it's a sad state that Paul was in. And again, nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. It's not like that was real then. It's not real today, you know? The reason there are very few men that, that are able to get into that position, they just don't naturally care. Okay? They don't just naturally care for the things of the Lord. Okay? I mean, it, it might take you know, a lot of effort to care for those things of the Lord. Right? It might take more, but there, is, there are some people that just naturally care. You know? and, and maybe that's part of just growing up and maturing. And, and maybe, maybe the ben- I had the benefit of growing up. A lot of you guys didn't have the you know, benefit of growing up in a Christian home you know, and, and Christian parents and being in church and, you know, my pastors, in, uh, my past, my, a couple of my uncles in Chile are pastors. Maybe just that, just growing up in a Christian environment, being in church, I, I just already as a child just had that natural care for the brethren. Maybe that's what it is. I, I don't know. You know, I don't think I'm special. But as, as we look at this, we see that most people are looking, okay, I'll become a pastor if I get X, Y, and Z. You know, when I became pastor, I had no idea. It's like, what's, what's it going to be like in the Sunshine Coast? Never lived there before. Okay, it doesn't look very multicultural. Are we, are we going to stand out, you know, South American, you know, Portuguese, European, you know, my kids half each. You know, are my kids going to stand out and look, you know, in, in Sydney, obviously, it's all multicultural. You know, are we going to have a place to, to meet for church? I don't know. Are we going to have a place to live? I don't know. Is there going to be anything in the offering besides what I give? I don't know. You know, just, you know but at the end of the day, I know there are brethren praying. They want a church up there and the Lord, you've shown me this and... It's just a, a natural care. You know, a natural care, for, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work out. You know? <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm willing to risk it. I, I'm, I'm willing to put it all on the line. I'm willing to get egg on my face if it fails. You know? And that's where the natural caring comes from. You know, a lot of people don't want that kind of risk. It, it, it requires a lot of faith. And, you know, it's much easier to basically, all right, I know I'm going to go here, I'm going to earn this much, and I'm going to have this house, and I'm going to have this, and I'll be just fine. Then that's most likely where somebody may want to take up that position. Boy, if you want to start a church from scratch, you just don't know. You know, honestly, you just, you just don't know, you know. And, but then you rely heavily upon the Lord, you know, heavily upon the Lord, and it increases your faith, okay? And again, this, this idea where, you know, oh, maybe he's doing it for the money. It just frustrates me because I know I naturally care. You know, I, again, I'm not trying to boast. I just, I, I, I naturally care for you guys, for these families here at New Life and also Blessed Hope Baptist Church. I want the best. You know, I can't wait for a second pastor to turn up, a man who naturally cares. I can't wait for that man to turn up, okay? Because I know that church will flourish with a good pastor, you know, but it's got to be the right man. You know, it's got to be one that naturally cares for the state of the people and it's not just their own desires and their own dreams and their own ambitions or whatever. It, it, they, you know, you really have to set those aside and think about the people that, you know, you'll be serving. You know, there, I, I remember once I was, at, uh, I was at Baptist Union Church. It was, um, 
I won't name the church. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the, so the, there was a pastor there. And if you, go, if you guys know the Baptist Union way, they, they basically cycle through pastors every few years. I don't know what, why they do that. I don't know if the pastor runs out of sermons. And it's like, well, let's get another man. <laughs> and you can preach your, your sermons, you know, to this other church. I don't know why they do that. But anyway, there was one pastor that served there for a while. And um, he ended up stepping down as a pastor just because he, I think he retired kind of thing. Anyway, so he becomes just a regular church member. And I think it was his first Sunday just as a regular member. They took up the offering, and one of the men who, you know, because they, they walk around with offering plates, and one of, the, one of the men went up to the pastor and said, well, now it's your time to put money in the offering plate. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> now it's your turn to put money in the offering plate. What? You know, it's, I find it funny. Like, that, is, that, is that what you thought? That, you know, you just take all the money, <laughs> and you don't actually put anything in there? But I guess that's what some people think. You know, I, I've never stopped tithing. Never. You know, when I first started tithing in my early 20s, till today, I, I've never stopped tithing. You know, I've never stopped giving to the house of God, even if it does come back into my pocket to some extent. But, you know, it's, it's frustrating when people think you have ulterior motives. You know, it's, it's weird. Can you please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23. This is a passage we read quite often, talking about the, the sufferings of Paul, how much he suffered for the Lord, right? And we focus on a lot of these verses. Let's read the verses. Verse number 23, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-three. 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes, that's whipping, above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. I hope one of those jet star planes never ends up in the ocean, man. <laughs> I don't want to suffer shipwreck like this. I don't, think, I don't think that plane will survive anyway. Verse number 26. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Man, I hope I don't have false brethren in this church. Or, or, or blessed hope about this church. That would break my heart. False brethren. But it, it's a reality. It could be, right? In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. So we, we often read about how much Paul suffered, right? But he does it because he loves the Lord. He loves the brethren, right? He's doing it for the kingdom of God. And we talk about, hey, hey, you know, in Australia, we're comfortable. And we are comfortable, aren't we? We don't get beaten and shipwrecked and all these kind of dramas, right? And, and so we read that and that motivates us. Yeah, praise God. You know what? Look what he suffered and what are we suffering? Hey, let's not be comfortable. Let's get off our seats. Let's go serve the Lord. Let's go preach the gospel. We encourage ourselves with that, right? And look, these are major things. These aren't easy things to go through, are they? But I don't want you to miss verse number 28. Because then he says, besides those things which are without. Okay, without. Then he says that which cometh upon me daily. The care of all the churches. What, Paul? Are you comparing your care for all the churches? The burden of caring for churches in the same paragraph, in the same line of thoughts of being shipwrecked and being beaten and being striped and being close to death. You're comparing your love and care for churches in the same regard? We often think we miss that, don't we? But that's actually what he's comparing. He goes, yeah, that's without, that's outside of the church. But, you know, I also have all these things that bother me in the same way, these burdens, these, these things, and look at, which come upon me daily. Yeah, okay, these other things were really horrible, but once it passes, it passes. You know, when you're looking after a church or even churches, you know what, this is a daily thing that's on your mind. My wife knows every day I'm thinking about church, right? I mean, my kids know I'm eating dinner, and they're like, Dad, you're, pre you're, you're preparing a sermon, aren't you? Because they just see my brain working. <laughs> you're thinking about something at church it's just how it is I, I didn't expect that to be the case you know I, I kind of thought well you know 
Monday or, you know, I'll get a sermon done and I'll, you know, then I won't have to worry about it till Wednesday and Tuesday I kind of can do other, no, Tuesday still thinking about something about church, right? Still, it's just how it is, right? It, it's, it's this burden. Uh, but again, it, you know, I'm not saying it's a horrible thing. It's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to serve the Lord, right? I mean, the Apostle Paul was the champion at, at praising God in all kinds of infirmities, all kinds of troubles, right? He praised the Lord no matter what. He was encouraged. And I feel the same way. You know, yeah, it's, it can be a struggle sometimes every day thinking about the churches, but really I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I, I know the Lord is pleased. But I want you to, you know, keep that in mind that, yeah, okay, Pastor Kevin's never been shipwrecked. Pastor Kevin's never been whipped or imprisoned. All right? But yeah, I mean, guess what? Uh, something that happens to me daily is the care of all the churches that's on my mind. So I, I need your support. You know, I need you guys praying for me. I need you to remember that. You know, if, if I haven't spoken to you or visited you or something and Pastor Kevin doesn't care about me, daily. I care about you daily. I pray about you daily. Okay, I, sometimes I might not stood on the outside. I don't know, you know. There's enough, there's things to do, right? There's enough people to talk to and get around. I want you to know that you're in my heart, in my minds daily, Okay. I need your support. I don't want you thinking that I don't care about you or care about the church. I do. I do, right? Can you please turn to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 7? Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 7. This is not just my message to this church. It's also the Lord's message to you, okay? In Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 7. The Bible reads, remember them which have the rule over you. Okay, to remember. Bring to remembrance. Okay, and we'll soon see this is about the pastor. Okay, he has the rule over you. Who have spoken unto you the word of God. Whose faith follow, follow considering the end of their conversation. Okay, so you know this is the guy. the, The one that has the rule over you in this context is the one who has spoken unto you the word of God. Okay, that's the, that's the pastor's job, okay? And yes, I have rule in the house of God. I don't have rule in your life. You know, I can't come to your house and tell you what to do. I can't tell your wife what to cook for dinner. I can't tell you what to watch on the TV or look on the computer. That's, that's your territory, right? But in the house of God, yes, I have rule in the house of God, okay? I'm glad I don't have rule anywhere else. It's too much, too much, okay? Uh, house of God is enough. Two, two, two churches right now, it's enough. I'm learning enough. Maybe one day there'll be three. Maybe one day there'll be four. But it's only once I've learned the lessons of having two. Okay? <laughs> There's enough to learn. All right. So I'm reading that to you because God is telling us, church members, you know, remember them which have the rule of you. Meaning you can forget. You can forget about the one that has the rule of you. Ah, oh, there's Pastor Kevin. He's preaching Sunday. He's coming Wednesday. And that's kind of it. No, remember. Bring to remembrance your pastor. I need your support. I need you guys to be thinking about me. Because I know if you're thinking about me, that's going to lead you to pray for me. I need your prayers. I really do. You know, the, the more people praying, the more the Lord's hearing uh, from a united church, uh, lifting up their pastor, it's, it's, he's going to answer prayers. He's going to help me. He's going to give me wisdom. And if it helps me, it's going to help the church. It's going to help you all, you know. You know, to destroy New Life Baptist Church, Satan just has to go after one guy. You know, me. Satan destroys me, can really hurt our church, all right? So, and he can destroy two churches <laughs> if he comes after me. So, please, uh, yeah, support me, keep me in your prayers. Um, and I can now turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, Th- 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And again, I'm not, I'm not preaching this because there's a shortage of this or I don't feel like you're supporting me. I, I just, again, it, it's all making sure that we don't get to this state, as a church, okay? <clears throat> it's better to do preventive action than corrective action. It's much harder to correct things when they go bad, okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 11. Again, these are the words of God toward a church. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So look, see, Paul is saying, you already do this. You already comfort each other and edify one another, but I'm still going to have to tell you to do it. Understand? So I'm not preaching this because there's some lapse or some problem that I'm addressing. I'm not. Okay? I'm just preaching to you, and as, as I, can, I can be like Paul and say, even as also you do. So support me, even as you're already doing it. 
Just keep doing it. Keep supporting uh, me. But look, not just me. Comfort each other. Edify one another. Okay? And again, please keep in mind that what you do to the brethren, you're doing it as unto the Lord. Okay? Please think about that. You know, the brethren need fellowship. Brethren need to know that you love them. They support them. You know? And again, you're doing it as unto the Lord. Verse number 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you, that's like the ruling over you, over you in the Lord, and admonish you. Okay? To admonish is basically to correct as well. Okay? Sometimes the pastor has to correct you. Okay? But even then, you know, keep that pastor in mind. That's part of the job. You know, if I ever have to correct you, you may get offended. But please, when you get offended, say, I got offended, but I know my pastor loves me. It's fine to get offended. Everyone gets offended. <laughs> Who cares? Okay, I get offended before you lose control. And my pastor does it because he loves me. You know, my, my pastor preached his sermon and he knows my position in life and this kind of embarrasses me because everyone in church knows my mistake and he preached it anyway and you might get frustrated the pastor. Don't. I preach because I love the church. Amen. I love the children. I love the people that have not made the same mistakes that maybe you have made. You know, Look at verse number 13. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. I don't know, I feel weird saying this to you, but that's what the Bible says. Okay, you're commanded to esteem me very highly in love, you know, for the work's sake. Verse number 14. And we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, Support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Okay, so we see, yeah, you ought to support your pastor, you ought to esteem him very highly, but hey, we ought to not just be like that to a pastor because we shouldn't be respecter of persons, right? We should love the brethren. We should love all men. We should do, uh, seek to do good to all men. We should not render evil for evil. Okay, if someone has done you evil, what do you do? Good. Now that's easier said than done. But that's what the Bible teaches. Someone has done you wrong, you do them right. It's very easy to just automatically try to do them evil in return. I know what the flesh is like. I know what the flesh thinks. Do them evil. It's like, oh, new man, is that right? New man goes, no, you're meant to do them good. Yeah, but I like that guy. The evil guy. <laughs> that's the one that I prefer to do. New man's, no, no, no. The Bible says, do them good. Okay, to all men. So it's not just esteeming the pastor, the brethren, but anyone you come across, you know, seek to be a blessing to others. Verse number, uh, you're in Hebrews, oh no, sorry. Please go to Hebrews 13. I sh sorry, I got these verses mixed up in my notes. Go to Hebrews 13. I know we were there just a while ago. Hebrews 13 and verse number 17. This is a sermon, I didn't have any notes. I just, I'm preaching from my heart basically, you know, today. I'm not preaching so much with my mind, <laughs> just with my heart, because I, you know, I love this church. You guys know that. I love Blessed Hope Baptist Church. I love the work that God has given me to do. I love being a pastor. It's awesome. Well, what a, well, it's wonderful. My, my favorite job I've ever had. Okay. But I wanted to end here in Hebrews 13, verses number, verse number 17, because it's not just support pastor for pastor's sake. This is good for you too. Okay. Hebrews 13, verse number 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Why? Why would you do that? For they watch for your souls. Do you believe that, brethren? Like, do you believe I'm watching for your soul? Do you believe I love you that much that, you know what, this, this, this gig of being a pastor is not actually for me? Do you, I, I don't know. Do you believe that? You know, I hope so. It's not just for me. I'm, I'm doing it because I'm watching for your souls. I care for you, you know? The sermons I preach is for you. It's not really for me. It is for me, of course, but it's really for the church. My mind is always, what does New Life Baptist Church have to hear? What do I need to preach? What do I need to cover? You know, I'm not thinking, what's the popular topic right now hitting the airwaves? And, and what's the, what, you know, that's not, that's not, I'm thinking, what does my church need? And when I'm down in Sydney, Blessed Hope Baptist Church, what do they need to hear? Okay? Because my, my desire is to watch for your souls. My desire is to feed you God's word to help you when you need it the most. And then it says this, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. 
I, when I face God, and I have to one day, I don't know when this is exactly, brethren, that, you know, when, when God's going to ask me, hey, you need to give me an account for New Life Baptist Church from 2017 to 2021 and whoever how long it goes. It's time for me, Pastor Kevin, give me an account for what happened. I want to do it with joy. I want to do it with grief. Oh man, God. Yeah, I, I said I was going to pass that church, but I just, man, we really missed, messed that one up, didn't we, Lord? Like, <laughs> I really messed up there, right? Uh, you know, my, my kids made a mistake and, you know, I had some family issues and people are pointing them out and they're leaving church and they're leaving you. And, you know, I thought it was that. Oh, good. Thank you for the writing about Samuel. I realized they were actually far from God to begin with. Right? And, uh, you know, with grief, I don't, I don't want to Why do I want that? I didn't come into this job just to, oh, man, this is the worst job. I want to be happy. You know, I heard recently Pastor Kevin preaches with a smile on his face. That's not good. What are you talking about? <laughs> Maybe, maybe the smile on my face proves I actually enjoy my job. I actually enjoy serving the brethren. I actually love the Lord and I'm, I'm praising the Lord. I want to do it with joy. Why shouldn't I preach with a smile on my face? I can't take it off my face. It's there. <laughs> There's a smile on my face because I want to do Yeah, because I'm happy. That's why. I'm happy serving the Lord. Why would I want to just come here with a grumpy face and get everyone cast down with a grumpy face? You know, there was a time to get grumpy. There's a time to get frustrated and mad and all that kind of stuff. But listen, I, you know, I want to I wanna be happy. You know, being, being a pastor, it, it gives me a lot of joy. You know, so if it comes out in my face, it just proves the truth that I actually enjoy the job. Okay, but I want to give an account with joy. I want to say, brother, you know, Jason was a blessing. You know, past, you know when, when I was uh, down in Sydney, you know, at uh, New, uh, Blessed Hope Baptist Church, you know, he was there ready to, to preach for us. And, and Brother Sam was there and, you know, they, they, you know, they were there. And, you know, I, I know they work full-time jobs and they've got a family. And Brother Sam just had a baby. But they were there. They loved the Lord. They were serving the Lord. They were there to preach God's word and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you know, Brother Caleb doesn't like getting up in front of everybody. I know that. But you know what? He knew Pastor was going to be away. And he said, you know what? I'm going to song lead no matter what. That's the, I want to give that kind of account. All right? The soul winning continued. You know, Brother Michael's putting the maps together and they're out there knocking doors. And, uh, you know, they don't see Pastor going go soul winning because I'm down in Sydney more often than not. But they continue it anyway because they love you and they love the gospel. They love the word. That's, what, that's the kind of account I want to give. Boy, it's profitable to you. God's going to reward you in heaven for the service you do for this church. But it really begins by supporting your pastor, understanding that you need to obey. You need to be submissive to the authority of the pastor. I need your support. You know, I, I, I need your support. I need you to know that I'm doing the best I can for both churches. You know, the best I can without sacrificing my family. You know, without causing too much, uh, you know, unnecessary risks. But look at verse number 18. Hebrews 13, verse number 18. It says, pray for us. That's what I need. For we trust we have a good conscience and in all things willing, willingly to live honestly. That's, that's my goal. I, I want to go to the grave with a clear conscience, a good conscience. You know, if, if, I, if my conscience is defiled as a pastor, I, 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 that's when I'll step down. You know, when, when I'm like, not, not if I've made a mistake or something like that. We all make mistakes, you know. But if, if I know that I just cannot preach God's word without a clear conscience, I know I cannot serve with a clear conscience. You know, I, I know I cannot travel between Sydney and Central Coast but with a clean conscience. I, I'm done. At that point, I'd just rather step down. Say, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to serve the church for X amount of years and this amount of time, you know. But, uh, you know, like, like Paul says, pray for us, you know. We trust, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. You know, I want this to be an honest job, the most honest job I've ever worked. That, that's what I want for uh, my position as a pastor. Look at verse number 19. And I beseech you, the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Okay, so I liked how that ended because I want to be restored, not just me, my wife, my family, right? restored back to you the sooner, the sooner. You guys know we plan the 12-month trip. You know, our goal, our desire is to be back here uh, second week of October, have our, our um, church anniversary, four years. Four years, praise God. There's been other IFB churches that have tried to plant themselves on the Sunshine Coast and they're gone. We're going strong, you know, four years into it. That's when we want to be back. And... Um, I want to be restored to you the sooner. You guys know the situation we're in, trying to find a place, a house. Um, so that's why I need your support as well, to be praying about that. You know, I don't want 
our restoration back to you guys here to be del- delayed for any reason. It might, it might be delayed. I don't know. It's outside of my hands. But keep praying. Keep praying that the Lord will re- uh, restore to uh, the Sepulveda family back to New Life Baptist Church the sooner. Okay, let's pray.